I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting CapitalAllocatorsPodcast.com. My guest on today's first meeting is Mike Novogratz, the CEO of Galaxy Digital, a merchant bank with a balance sheet to invest that seeks to serve as the bridge between the crypto and institutional investment worlds. Mike is a well-known speculator who started his career at Goldman Sachs and later managed Fortress's multi-billion dollar global macro fund. He's notably made and lost a few fortunes in his career, most recently riding Bitcoin up starting in 2013, almost all the way down and back up again earlier this year. Our conversation covers Mike's background as a wrestler and helicopter pilot, his development from salesman to trader, the art of speculation, his initial interest in Bitcoin, the business of Galaxy Digital, the development of the crypto ecosystem use cases in privacy, payments, and video games, and obstacles to institutional adoption of crypto and blockchain assets. We close by discussing how Mike invests his family office assets and his engagement with criminal justice reform. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. All opinions expressed by guests on the show are solely their own opinion and do not necessarily reflect those of their firm. The manager's appearance on the show does not constitute an endorsement or investment recommendation by TED or Capital Allocators. Please enjoy my first meeting with Mike Novogratz of Galaxy Digital. Mike, thanks for joining me. Ready to have fun. Well, let's start with just growing up in your family, way back when. You know, I was the third of seven kids, big Catholic family. We grew up kind of in a John Hughes movie in that it was like suburbia (laughs) USA. There were cheerleaders and jocks and freaks and just a classic middle-class upbringing. Great public high school. My dad was an army officer. We moved around a decent bit when I was young, young, but K to 12, we lived in the DC area. And so I had a pretty stable friend group and experience, not the classic army brat experience, in a pretty lovely youth. I used to say I grew up in a snow globe because we kind of thought the whole world was like our world. You know, you didn't have the internet back then. You didn't have Facebook. And so like your little universe was a big universe. Kind of cool. And I know you were a wrestler back then. What were the key things you took out of wrestling? My dad put me into wrestling when I was like third grade. And I was pretty good at it. And what I realized is you, you stick with things you're good at because it just feels better. Wrestling's not a fun sport <laughs> by any stretch, but it's a tough sport. And I was a skinny, scrawny little guy. And so learning to be tough and getting tough, I think, was, was the biggest thing. You learn not to be scared. You learn to walk off your front foot. The other thing in wrestling is you don't win all the time. You actually get the crap beat out of you a lot. And so learning how to like get the crap beat out of you and get back up and go back at it. Almost nobody has never lost, right? Kale Sanderson had that one great run, but then he even lost. And so I think it's the resilience is probably the biggest lessons. And so you come out of Princeton and you dabble in your father's footsteps? Is that- you know, I was at ROTC, you know, back in 1983 when I graduated from high school, even the Ivy League, you know, while they gave financial aid, they didn't give great financial aid. And being one of seven and parents that were not great savers, I could have either gone to a state school, UVA, and I would even maybe got a half wrestling scholarship there or finance my college somehow. And ROTC was, it was kind of a financing option. We didn't really think we were joining the army. Like our whole neighborhood applied for ROTC scholarships because that's what you did. And so I got to Princeton, the government paid for all but my room and board, which of course was still a lot of money, which I couldn't afford. And so I took student loans, you know, there and I had a ROTC scholarship. And so when I graduated, it was supposed to be four years in the army. Reagan had built up the army so much in the eighties that they realized they had too many young officers. And so they, they asked for volunteers to join the national guard. And by the time the sentence was half done, my hand was up. I was lucky enough to get flight school. And so I spent 18 months in officer school and then learning how to fly helicopters. And then I 
switched over to the Jersey National Guard and got to defend the great state of New Jersey. <laughs> From what I'm not sure. You know, it's funny. When I was in the Guard, it was kind of a flying club. And if you had told me they would use the Guard in battle, I would have thought you had literally been smoking the funny stuff. We had great pilots in our unit. They were all ex-Vietnam vets. They had flown Air America, the covert war in Cambodia. They had really some of the best pilots, and they had demoted themselves to warrant officer, which is just pilot. And so I'd go up there and say, our troops, and they'd be like, listen, lieutenant, this is how it's done. We're going here. We're going here. You go wherever you want. And so I literally thought, no chance. And Goldman Sachs asked me to go to Tokyo, so I went on to the inactive guard. Six months after I'm in Tokyo, they sent my unit to Bosnia. <laughs> and so I raised my right hand and swore to defend the Constitution. And I spent a lot of time in and around the military, though I never really served actively in any kind of combat zone. But my freaking unit went to Bosnia. <laughs> what was that gut feeling like when you're on the other side of the world? When you're young, I remember when Tiananmen Square happened and that young guy in front of the tank and you felt like, God, those guys have their moment and we're sitting over here. We got nothing to do. And, and then even when Saddam invaded Kuwait in Desert Storm 1, all my buddies from flight school were over there. And I literally felt like a punk. I'm like, I'm missing my chance. And look at it now, like, what an idiot you were. Like, none of my friends who went to war really liked it. <laughs> you know, it's a horrible, horrible experience blowing people up. And, and so probably by the grace of God, I missed it all. But at that moment, I felt like I was being gypped. I was like, here, I'm freaking sitting behind a Wall Street desk, and I could be over there fighting. And how'd you find your path into trading? I started at Wall Street as a salesman, and I was kind of a natural-born sales guy. My mother could sell anything. My, we're a family of storytellers. And I always thought I could talk my way into anything. And so I was having a really successful career as a salesman. And I thought my college roommate was a very successful trader, and I thought... I know I can outsell him. I'm not sure I can outtrade him. What edge do I have versus him? I didn't think I'd be worse than him, but I didn't think I had an edge. And I knew I had an edge selling. So that was my logic. And my fourth year at the firm, I had a monster year selling and made a fortune for the firm. And I got paid fine. Well, there was a colleague of mine in London who had made a fortune as a trader, and he got paid six times what I got paid. And I went haywire. I was like, this makes absolutely no sense. I was making risk-adjusted better money than he was. And I yelled at John Corzine, who was my mentor and friend. And he was like, listen, kid, there are a lot of guys that can sell. There are very few guys that can hit a 100-mile fastball 300 feet through the air. And I was like, well, I'll try. And so he switched me to trading. Were you still in Asia then? I was in Asia, and he asked me to move from Tokyo to Hong Kong to run the Asian trading business. So you went from not trading to running the trading business? Well, to starting this, yes, to running the trading business. And he gave me a year. It was a brilliant year. It was like I had a 007 license and a bulletproof jacket. I flew around to the different offices and I sat with all the best traders at Goldman Sachs and interviewed him and tried to figure out who did what and who was good and did my own education of both reading and just meeting people. And I spent my first two years successful, but not really confident to put risk on enough to make a whole lot of money. I was being too prudent. I had a great batting average. And I almost quit because you just didn't make enough money to be as relevant. And then the Asian crises happened in 97. And a lot of people in this business get their jump of confidence in nonlinear moves. You know, so all of a sudden, Goldman Sachs, Asia's blowing up. And we predicted it, had the foresight, and had some spectacularly highly leveraged bets that Asia would blow up that we were smart enough to figure out. It wasn't I had so much courage that I took all this risk to make a fortune. I found a way with limited risk to make a fortune. And boom, once it blew up and we made a couple hundred million dollars, you go from being a $10 trader to a $50 trader to a $100 trader, and now you're a big guy. And that confidence jump happened all at once. 1997 in Asia were like dog years. I mean, it was literally seven years in one. We worked our tails off, had an amazingly profitable and exciting time. And that kind of was my first big jump. In those couple of years, so you started by trying to pick off lessons from people you saw the best traders, then you had an experience of being one. What are the things you took out of the lessons and then the applied lessons? 
First of all, that there are a thousand paths to Buddhahood, and there are lots of lanes in trading. And your personality and your skill set has to match the lane you're in. And so if you're an arbitrageur, it's a very different skill set than if you're a macro trader, a pure speculator. And as you move from what I'll call complete commercial or mercantile things, like arbitrage, if I told you we could buy this soda here for 50 cents and drive it 30 blocks north to the Upper East Side and sell it for $2, we both say, let's do that as many times as we can. Commercial guys make the same decision. If we had all the information about the regulation coming in Bitcoin, if we had the newspapers from next December and we had the volume numbers of exchanges and we had comments from some of the big prognosticators, we still might make very different decisions on what to do with Bitcoin. And so as you move away from really commercial things to really intuitive or speculative things, it takes a different skill set. And so that was my first big lesson. It was like Pete Brigger, my partner at Fortress, he could never do my job and I could never do his. And yet we're both investors. He couldn't do mine because he couldn't live with the risk. And I couldn't do his because I have none of the toughness and diligence to cross T's and dot I's and that a distressed debt investor needs. And so that was it. It's like find your lane and be comfortable in your lane is the biggest lesson I learned. And, and my lane is speculating. It's very intuitive. And so what's hard about that is you're not exactly sure why you're good. You're like, ooh, I had this amazing breakthrough moment. You know, I'd left Goldman Sachs. I'd started this hedge fund. I was 18 months into it. And I was kind of miserable. I was just so much stress that I was going to shut it down even. My wife said, dude, you just hired like your best friend. You can't shut the thing down. And I was like, I just, if I'm, I don't want to come home miserable every day. And I'm having lunch with, the prime minister of Israel, the ex-prime minister, Ehud Barak, who is one of the smartest guys and most charming guys I've ever met. And he says, no, I figured you out. He says, you're not very smart, but you're lucky. And I looked at him with a little grin, and then he said something in French. And he's like, oh, I forgot you're not so smart. You don't speak French. And he translated. And it was a quote from Napoleon, which says, I don't hire smart generals. I hire lucky generals. And it was that the best generals have an intuition to see the battlefield. They've got battlefield vision. They, they know when to attack and not attack. And, and there's not a word for it, so they call it luck. But it's a different type of intelligence. And the moment he said that, it just clicked. It liberated me. I was like, well, that's why I make money. And then I look back and I was like, I was Goldman's top sales guy for two years. And I thought I was a sales guy because all the guys liked me. And I was like, no, I was a good sales guy because I was right on the market all the time. And they wanted to talk to me, not because, you know, I was charming, because I was right. And it, that lucky enough that my brain sees the future better than, than norm. And a lot of it's just pattern recognition. It's not a conscious pattern recognition. You, great macro traders, I always say, can figure out how many jelly beans are in a jar better than the next guy. It's just kind of this gut calculation that goes on. We're in this data-driven, model-driven world. Like, have you ever tried to encapsulate what you think those intuitions are to build processes to make it more repeatable? So one of my dear friends and, and mentors and a far more successful speculator than me, a guy named Paul Jones, he was obsessed with this because he was like, listen, all macro traders try. You're like, there's an algorithm in my head that I don't completely understand, but let me see if I can write it down and codify it. And so the machine can do it. So then I don't have all the damn stress of feeling stupid or feeling, you know, oh, I should have or... Once you have this intuition to say, I think, I think the market's going up, then you got to act on it. And so what stops you is anxiety. It's fear management. It's risk management. It's anxiety management. And so if I can have a set of rules that's programmed into a computer, oh my God, that's like the holy grail. And so Paul had tried, he hired the best guys in, in chess to do it, right? The guy that program Big Blue and IBM way back. And he had people follow him around and look at every last thing he did. And none of us macro traders, and I've tried quant businesses over and over, have really ever been successful at programming themselves. Listen, you look at what Jim Simons has done, and you know, he is the Buddha. Like I said, there's many past the Buddha. He's the one. He's the single greatest track record in the history of this sport of investing. There's not a close second. And so just is impossible. I haven't been able to do it myself. I wish I did. I mean, listen, even just recently, I, I went on to Fast Money or one of those shows and I was talking about the 
crypto rally. And I said, well, looks like we put a tradable top. I sold some. I wish I sold more. We're going to be in a 10,000, 14,000, 9,000, 14,000 range. And now I'm waking up this morning. I was like, I said it on TV. I only sold X percent of my portfolio. I thought the market was most likely going down. I should have sold. Like, what the age was I doing? How did I, after 30 years of doing this, still make the simple mistake of not completely trusting myself? It's a really hard business to trust yourself. So you traded macro instruments? I traded macro. So it was interesting. When I was at Hong Kong, they said, well, we want you to run the fixed income markets in Asia. And I looked around. I was like, well, you don't have enough liquidity in the fixed income markets in Asia. And so to trade them, I mean, you need to trade currencies and equities and, and not just in Asia, but you also need to trade the S&P and treasuries because you're going to be hedging out these macro risks. And so it was intuitive to me and Lloyd Blankfein, who was my immediate boss at the time, completely agreed and, and Corzine that you needed to have all the weapons. And so I got my start as a macro guy literally from day one of seeing how all the different markets fit together. And so when I started a hedge fund, I was more emerging market focused when I was in Asia. It was just a natural progression to say, I'll trade anything. And quite frankly, crypto is just another market. Everybody you know, says, well, you're a crypto trader. You're not. You're just a speculator. You're speculating on a different widget. A pretty cool one because it's new and there's this frenzy around it at times. But it's just a widget. So let's turn a little bit to your transition to the crypto world now, where were you at the time when you first started hearing about it? You know, I was at Fortress. I was running a macro fund. And ironically, Pete Brigger, who would have been the last guy on the planet I would have thought of to be the Bitcoin guy. But he had moved to San Francisco. And one of his friends in his YPO group, a guy named Wences Caceres, who in a lot of ways is like patient zero for a lot of us Bitcoiners, Wences had been preaching Bitcoin to Pete. Pete called me up. He didn't want to, he said, dude, you know anything about this stuff? Look into it. And so I did like a two minute, well, you know, 15 minute, 20 minute scan on Google and started looking at it and started asking my guys on the desk and a couple of them hadn't heard about it and surmised really quickly that this is a perfect speculative instrument. What year was this? 2013-ish. Bitcoin was trading around 95, 100. And I was like, dude, cool technology. There's a community of people, cypherpunks, libertarians, off the grid, people that are going to be attracted to it. The Chinese had started buying. And remember, we were post, we were right coming off of the European financial crisis. QE was going, you know, rates were going to zero. People like Paul Singer thought we were going to have hyperinflation. They were taking ads out in the Wall Street Journal that Ben Bernanke should be in jail. I mean, there was a lot of craziness around what QE would do. And so here's this hard money construct, technologically cool. And I was like, dude, this is going to be a bubble. And so we literally started buying and bought a decent bit right away, 90, 100. And then Pete and I were like, this is going to be a bigger business than we think. And let's build a business around this. Talk to our other partners. And then we're like, you know, Fortress is such a hard money Distress debt, like Bitcoin. We decided we didn't want to do it at Fortress. I actually kind of did, but the collective didn't. I said, well, who do we know? And Dan Moorhead, who now runs a company called Pantera, had been a classmate of mine and a friend. And he was on the sidelines. He had left a job running an exchange business for Ed Smith and Deutsche Bank and had run a hedge fund and shut the hedge fund down. And his hedge fund was also called Pantera. So we called Dan up and I said, Dan, look into this thing. And Dan was like a much better student at Princeton than I was. He called back after two weeks. He was like, oh my God, it's going to change the whole world. And we're like, well, how much are you going to buy? And he bought a lot, a big percentage of his net worth. And so the three of us all bought a decent bit, a lot because Dan was so constructive. And it went from, at that point, uh, 100 to 1,000 really quick. And the only reason I actually became a Bitcoin public spokesman, I was at a, I was at a conference, was UBS wealth management conference. It was boring as hell panel. And someone asked me about frontier currencies, thinking about these emerging, emerging market, you know, the real emerging market currencies like Tanzania. And I was like, ah, horseshit with those things. I said, if you want a frontier currency, you should buy Bitcoin for these four reasons. Very succinct. Had no idea the press was there. The next morning I was on the cover of the FT. The only time I was on the cover of the FT, unfortunately. No regrets says Bitcoin going to a thousand. And it went right to a thousand. And so 
my first prediction was a good one. What were those four reasons at the time? Do you remember? Chinese buying, people worried about this hyperinflation fear, very cool technology, right? Instead of in God we trust and cryptology we trust. And sponsorship from this community I talked about before. It was pretty simple. So when I got on TV and started talking about Bitcoin, I got a message, email, or Bloomberg message, I forgot, from another classmate of mine, and actually a roommate in college, Joe Lubin. And he was like, dude, I didn't know you were a Bitcoin guy. And he was down in Bermuda or Barbados coding away on this new project called Ethereum. And he was like, we got a new thing that's going to kick Bitcoin's ass. And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what he did. He was talking about. But so Joe was a computer science major at school and stupidly smart and a great squash player. And so that was in the back of my head. I had this idea that Ethereum existed. I left Fortress. My hedge fund didn't do so well my last year. When you leave Wall Street, you almost always leave grumpy. There's a little broken glass. You're angry. You, you screwed up. You know, very few people leave on top. And I certainly didn't. I left with a lot of money, but I certainly didn't leave on top. I was a little bit embarrassed and frustrated. And I looked at my portfolio and I thought, well, I got all this Bitcoin. It, it, it had gone up and it had gone back down. It was doing nothing. And I have all these investments. I have investment in Zoppo and Bitstamp and funds. And I said, what am I going to do with all this stuff? And so I called Joe, who had moved back to New York. And I said, Joe, let me come talk to you about all this stuff I have. And I went over to his office in Brooklyn, and I literally thought it was going to be him and, you know, one guy or dog. And there was this vibrant office, and it was literally the beginning of this company consensus. And it took me about 30 minutes to realize something really special was going on, that this was much more than just kind of the Bitcoin thing, that there was a revolution, this decentralized revolution. And these people really cared, and they talked like revolutionaries. We're going to change the world. We're going to decentralize. We're going to take these silos of data and smash them to smithereens. And it was an infectious energy. I actually tried to buy a chunk of consensus. And I would have if it was actually a little more. I was like, all right. And Joe got excited about it. And then I was like, well, write down what the company looks like. And then it looked like spaghetti. And he was like, it's going to take me a while. And I think by now he's figured out what the company looks like. But Joe's a believer. It's a completely decentralized company. And so instead of that, I bought a bunch of Ethereum. I actually bought Ethereum from Vitalik. No one else was selling it. So I called him up and he remembered me from the dinner. So he sold me some of his Ethereum at 96 cents, one of my great buys of life. And then I started trading it. And as you know, it went from one to eight and then to 20 and back down. And now I've got more time because I'm not at Fortress. It's exciting. And, and I wasn't public again. Joe asked me to be on some panel. And yet again, I mentioned, I think I have 15, 20% of my net worth in this stuff at this point. And... I didn't realize the press was there again because I'm a knucklehead. And I went to like literally every newspaper it seemed in the freaking world mentioned that. And it's right when the stuff took off again. And so, again, a little bit lucky in that if I didn't know Joe, I wouldn't have bought Ethereum at one. I wouldn't have made as much money. And by already being wealthy, it gave you the staying power of not selling it right away. And so when I look back on my life, the Ethereum trade probably is the greatest trade I ever had because I sold it. Some at a hundred, and some at three fifty, and bought it back, and some at a thousand, and it was a uh, great experience. But it also sucked me into this community, and as I got more involved, it's fun to be part of the revolution. And I saw this role. Originally, I saw the role as this bridge between the institutional world and this kind of crazy crypto world, and I thought that was kind of the role I play, mostly as a spokesperson. And when we thought about starting Galaxy. First, I was going to do a hedge fund, and I was like, I don't really want to run another hedge fund. And I thought the market was way overdone. I was selling everything, and I was like, it's really hard to run a hedge fund in a, in a speculative market when everything's going down. And so decided to do a company with permanent capital. And probably, and I look back, even though I was bearish and even hedging on our book, of course, you never realize how bad a bear market gets. It went down 95-odd percent. But the idea was... Let's be this company in the middle of the space and not just be the bridge, but also provide guidance to this new crypto world who don't really understand finance. Even still, I think some of the great VC funds, they don't understand how to sell. And this isn't VC. This is kind of VC where the liquidity comes way too early. I mean, you look at what just happened with Algorand, right? They first print as a $20 billion ecosystem. And I was like, I've seen $20 billion companies and ecosystems, and they look a lot more vibrant than this one. Let me sell it as much as I can. And so how do you get a short on? 
And so I do think having the Wall Street and the speculating experience is a really good tool for operating in the crypto space. And we're trying to use this firm to help clients, to give advice, to participate in all sides of the space. So what is Galaxy today? Well, we have four businesses, as I said. We have a trading business that we're trying to be a liquidity provider, both OTC and electronically, to market participants from funds to institutions to high net worth individuals and to exchanges. We're building a derivatives business. The derivative market is really nascent in a prime brokerage business. And so one of the big trading engines. We have an investment banking business, an advisory business that is going to, in time, provide merger and acquisition advice, strategic advice, and, and raise capital for people. So we're out trying to raise capital around a few projects right now. And then we have an asset management business that will try to run other people's money. Right now we have one big fund that we run, mostly focused around digital gaming space with a blockchain focus. We have a balance sheet that we do a lot of private investing all across the space. So in security and exchanges and you name it, we'll invest in it. So we're direct investors off our balance sheet, and then we're advisors, traders, and asset managers. So if you go back two years, 2017, and Bitcoin's having this huge run, there's a couple of long-term theses with decentralization, store of value, all that. As you look two years later, prices moved up and down and back up again, but a lot's probably happened underneath that people who are outside the space don't know about. So as you look at the crypto world yeah, today... So great bubbles happen around great stories, right? This was such a powerful story that it created this global phenomena. First global bubble we've really had, right? Where Taiwan and Korea and Japan and India and Russia and everyone was buying into this decentralized story, this new... And so in 17, it all went up. And what happened was there was this crazy supply response, Everyone was launching the new Bitcoin. Ethereum was the better Bitcoin. Then Litecoin was the Bitcoin for poor people. And, you know, I mean, you had this kind of crazy, there was Dogecoin. And everyone in their mind thought it was just another Bitcoin. What happens when you have supply swallow a market, market collapses? And so a combination of too much supply, because everyone was seeing it all as fungible, and a little bit of a regulatory tap on the brakes, because regulators were way off. They were just caught way off guard. They were caught off guard because regulators talked to institutions and no institutions were playing. They don't talk to mom and dad. This was mom and dad's revolution. Then we had this collapse, literally a 95, 96% collapse. And out of the rubbish, we started kind of rebuilding. Well, in that sucking in of money and you were also sucking in capital and talent and building infrastructure and, and a lot of the good projects were being worked on. And so bubbles have a positive side to them. It sucks in resource. And so this rally back this year, which happened a lot faster than people might have thought, is a lot more rational in that the bulk of it went to Bitcoin. And in a lot of ways, it's because Bitcoin went from originally being this decentralized money to really a decentralized hard asset, decentralized gold. You can still call gold a money, but it's really not a transactional money. It's a hard asset. And in that box, Bitcoin's kind of done. The project is finished. It's good enough to be decentralized gold. It doesn't have to change. And so gold's got an $8 trillion market cap. Bitcoin's got about $150, $160 billion, depending on what price it's at. A long way to go. Now, Ethereum and Algorand and EOS and Definity and all of these other protocols are vying to be Web 3.0. This decentralized global supercomputer where we process data in a private or cryptographic way to retain our privacy and bring efficiency. And this wonderful world, all of that stuff is a couple years, three years, four years away from really being vibrant, from being a product that you can really use. There's test cases, you can do stuff on it now, but there's nothing really happening in a big way on it. And so markets get ahead of themselves, but now markets are a little more rational. The moment you start thinking, this isn't going to be the digital gold, but it's going to be used, you start coming into some discounted cash flow model. Okay, there's got to be some valuation. If it processes data, if it's a supercomputer, it's data times something equals something. And you start 
playing even subconsciously with that math. You say, okay, what's the first thing this, this Web 3.0 can replace? The cloud. The whole market clap of the cloud is less than a trillion dollars. So it's one-tenth of gold, one-eighth. Yes. Amazon's cloud, Google's cloud, Alibaba's cloud. Take their cloud earnings, put a market cap. This is a rough, rough math, but, but it's not eight trillion. And so that group of protocols, first step are going for a smaller pie than Bitcoin was going for. You started off by saying you were a gifted salesman. And salesman gets attached to brands. And so you think about Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud or whatever it is. How does a decentralized protocol develop a brand that it could possibly replace something that has big brand name behind it? It's interesting. So Bitcoin's got this great brand and it's going to replace gold over time or at least supplement gold in a big way. It's going to have to be two things. It's going to have to be so easy to use, right? So the user experience, the user interface is going to have to be far, far better than it is today. And people are going to have to demand, and this might come from governments as well, a level of privacy. The thing that excites me most about being part of trying to help birth this blockchain revolution is we are losing privacy at a stunning pace. You know, you look at China right now where 95% of financial transactions go through a government clearinghouse, which they now just add a little bit of machine-based learning to, and they know everything about you. Like, that's a 1984 scary-as-hell proposition to me. All of that stuff should be behind the firewall of a blockchain. And will it ever get there? I don't know, but that's the hope. And so will consumers care that they've given up their privacy? I don't know. I mean, it's a big debate. In the medical records field, in medicine, and look at 23andMe. You gave your DNA to this lovely woman who now knows everything about you, and you paid her to own your DNA. Like, that's insanity. And I did the same thing. I looked at that little stick. I was like, ooh, let's see where I'm from, right? She knows everything about me. That should be behind a firewall. That data is valuable data for, for researchers to use, is valuable data for me, but it should be private. And the question is, can you kind of rebuild some of these systems? Like pricing data dies after a while. So that's the DNA data is out there. You're like, okay, that sucks. But I think we'll see if this all does work or not. And where are the other big use cases? You mentioned the Web 3.0 and the cloud. Listen, payments is going to be a really interesting battle here. And Libra, I think Libra is a really cool project. Will it get off the ground? It's got its work to do. But I think it's a really cool project because it starts this, it's a Trojan horse way to have a market for money. So they start by having a stable-ish coin backed by dollars and euros and renminbi and, and yen and whatever other currencies they put in. And five, six years later, if that has enough acceptance and trust, they can, just like the silver certificate became the dollar, you know, we're not backed by silver anymore. It wouldn't have to be backed. It'll just be its own currency. It's a democratic and a democratizing thing. It goes right at banks. The spreads banks choose, even in credit cards and fees, and go to the ATM and you pay two fifty to take a dollar out. And if you're poor, you're taking twenty dollars out because that's what you're taking out, and you're paying two fifty. So you're literally paying twelve and a half freaking percent to get your money out of a bank. Bizarre, but it happens to entire half of our country that doesn't make a whole lot of money. This is going to be free. And so you're going to transfer money from Bangladesh to Abu Dhabi because you're, you're a laborer in Abu Dhabi because they all come from Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and, and poorer countries. So for remittances, for transfers of money, for buying things, it'll make the world far more efficient. It's going to take a lot of fat out. Why are people fighting it? Banks are fighting it because it's going right after their business. And, you know, listen, will Facebook be the guy? You know, Telegram is something to watch. The guy who runs Telegram is sharper than a tack. He's got a great engineering team. They are 280 million users. They're passionate users. I think it'll be one of the coolest things to watch this year, how they spin that out. In the next few years, we're going to start seeing the revolution. And I think payments is one area. The other area, and we're focusing on this, is the video gaming space, the digital world, VR, games, you know, with 5G coming, this stuff is going to happen so fast. And that's where the quick adopters are. And so that space, I think you'll see really cool use cases. So you mentioned that when you have that bubble, you're able to bring resources into the ecosystem. 
the big dollars ultimately come from institutions. Yes. Where are we on institutions thinking about the crypto world? Let's start with the bright news first. The Yale Endowment, which is always the leader, are already in, right? They made a fairly sizable investment with Paradigm, a firm out, out in California. Harvard and Stanford are in. And so the big university endowments are already having their first bets on the board. That forces every other pension fund and endowment to look. We've had meetings with 700 different institutional investors. And I'm not telling you they're all on the two-yard line, but they're all moving towards the goal line. And they're nervous. They're worried. They had a few things, custody, custody, custody. Well, now we've got good custody. You've got BitGo, good custody. You've got New York Dig. You've got Fidelity. You've got this guy's anchor out in San Fran. And so you got real custody places. BACT is coming on soon. New York Stock Exchange's group. And so you're going to check that box. What Facebook did, or this Libra product did, is say, wait a minute, MasterCard, Visa. So now you're sitting at the state of Wisconsin, and you've got cover. You're like, well, MasterCard and Visa, and all these people are doing it. Well, let's, let's put a chip on the table. And so I think this Facebook project really accelerated institutional money coming in. It's not rushing in yet. And we're not getting to 20,000 without it. This run up from 4,000 to 13,000 and back now to nine and a half thousand, wherever we are, was people front running that enthusiasm of this is actually happening. The president of the United States was just talking about it. Steve Mnuchin, the secretary of treasury was just talking about it. Like this is now going to be part of our financial and consumer infrastructure for the rest of our lives. It's not going to start tomorrow, but in 10 years time, crypto and, and blockchain will be part of all infrastructure. That realization is dawning on people. And so institutions are going to make it in. Is it the next six months? I hope so. Because you're trying to build a business out and you're like, oh, you're waiting for Godot and you hope he shows up on the subway train. But I'm not wrong on destination. I could be wrong on timing and when they all come. How do you bring together these sort of two aspects of what you've done? So on the one hand, you get into Bitcoin and think of it as a speculative vehicle. On the other hand, you've taken a big chunk of your time and some capital and put it into a business that's locked into this ecosystem. <laughs> so this is really fascinating to me. The venture piece of it, I sit, I hear all these new young businesses and how we're going to change the world. And, and so intellectually, this is a fascinating place to be. It's neat to have a place in it, to have a role as one of the spokespeople or commentators on the space. And so you get a sense of purpose that way. It would have been a lot easier just to be a speculator. I got a family office. You know, when you have a family office, people come and they shine your shoes. And they tell you how good looking you are. And, and I told our whole group, I was like, guys, now we're the shoe shiners. We're in the client service business. And so get on your damn knees and start polishing shoes. So it's a mindset shift. And so it comes with a little bit of work and stress, but I do think the reward is, you know, is like being part of the, what will be, I think, a really big industry in 10 years. And what do you think the risks are that it doesn't play out as you're anticipating? Well, there are, I think, three big risks. One is that we're here building away, and, and in two years' time, David Solomon tells his army of warriors, hey, we need to be in this business faster than we thought. And, you know, Goldman and JP and everybody else is trading and lending, and, and they just have so many resources that they can move quick. And so we need to build fast enough to be a player before the competition comes. They're going to come. There is absolutely no way that in five years' time, at least, you're not calling up your broker and saying, you know, dollar, yen, and cable, and Bitcoin, and Libra, and gold. And they're going to all get traded on the same desk. And so we need to get in first. There is a regulatory risk continues. The big risk, and, and Mnuchin talked about it, is money laundering and terrorism financing. And so can you really get the AML KYC done well enough? I think yes, but the infrastructure is not there yet to do that. And so one of the things we're investing in is companies that are part of that space, like security. And you're going to need to build a whole lot of infrastructure for this to be part of the, the way business gets done. And the third is just your own execution risk. And so Building a business is hard. You got to pick the right people. You got to put them in the right seats. You got to mentor young people so they're, they become talented. And we have 85 people now. We're growing. 
it's hard to build a business. The markets aren't really there yet. So there's not enough. The only place people are making real money is in the retail exchanges. And most of them offshore where they're taking all kinds of regulatory. They have more regulatory movement, you know, not as tight on the KYC stuff. And so Binance and Bitfinex and I mean, BitMEX, I mean, BitMEX, Arthur Hayes is the best business on the planet, right? I mean, he's providing huge leverage for Asian gamblers in a lot of ways. And having lived in Asia for seven years, they like to gamble. They could gamble on the price of these glasses or on a Bitcoin. And so that liquidity engine is literally based on gambling. It's not based on these, oh, we're making these long-term strategic investments in Dogecoin. (laughs) No, it's what's hot, where's the liquidity we're gambling. And so those businesses are very, very profitable. Most other businesses just haven't been making money yet. So when you look at your family office, you've got a nice chunk of time capital in this ecosystem. What are you doing with the rest of your pie? I have a private equity group downstairs called Durational, two young guys that are stunningly ambitious and talented. You see my Bojangles box. They bought Bojangles fried chicken. And so I I love talking about the barbell between chicken and Bitcoin. (laughs) I have a macro team downstairs. We still trade macro. It's talking to my shrink about it today. I was like, I'm not sure. I said, but I think for 30 years I wake up and it's my adrenaline shot and it keeps me in touch with what's going on in the world. And so I still trade macro myself. I've got a couple guys downstairs. I've got an arbitrage business called Sea Otter that I'm a big investor in that lives downstairs, and then a big venture portfolio. And then I spend about 30% or 25% of my time on criminal justice reform. So most of my philanthropy, and we've got a bunch of guys downstairs, is around trying to shed light and make change in this horrific justice system that we have in our country. The deeper you dig, the more disgusted and dumbfounded you are. I mean, we have literally one of the worst prison systems in the world. We're the richest country in the world with the shittiest criminal justice system. And that's changing. The the optimism now is that for like 30 years, this group of really dedicated social justice warriors have been pushing this ball up this hill and it kept rolling back on them. And it's just now cresting the hill. And so the Sophian task is in the balls rolling down and, and lots of people are getting involved. And so We helped stand up a thing called the Bail Project. That's now a big, vibrant organization run by Robin Steinberg. I teamed up with Michael Rubin out of Philly and and Jay-Z and Meek Mill and Bob Kraft and Rob Smith and Clara Sy and Dan Loeb, all these rock stars on their own right to take on probation and parole in a group called Reform. And so we probably are making grants or donations and working with 25 different organizations in the space and really just trying to push the ball, be another guy on the, on the right side of history, shoving the ball downhill. If you take one example of something you've done within criminal reform and put some meat on something very specific that you got involved in that worked. Yeah. So listen, the bail project, I helped get started. We've raised $70 million plus money before then, there were the largest bail funds might have been one or two that were a million dollars and most $200,000. And so we brought scale to this idea. The bail story is really simple. Tonight, 500,000 people will go to bed in a jail cell, dirty, stinky, dangerous jail cell, solely because they can't afford bail. 90% of Rikers Island are people there pretrial. And so we pay bail. If... I don't pay bail, you're in jail, you're seven times more likely to plead guilty. And if I pay your bail, 50% of the time the DA drops the charges. Like we have a whole justice system that's based on blackmailing people into saying they're guilty. Now, a lot of people are guilty. I'm not saying they're not. But like, if you're wealthy, you don't, you don't spend the night in jail. It's just so unjust. 40% of prison death and 40% of prison rape happens in the first week you're in jail. Right, so jail is one year under, prison is one year over. And so you literally are brand new in this freaking jail. You might have done something really shitty, or you might have done something like get in a fight because you were drunk, or steal something from the 7 Eleven, or get in an argument with your wife that got loud and someone calls the neighbors because she threw the vase at you. <laughs> you know, look, like my wife has thrown a vase at me once or twice. And, you know, in my neighborhood, you don't go to jail for that. In bad neighborhoods, you do go to jail for that. And so 
the simple act of paying someone's bail is revolutionary. I did it up in the Bronx once. And you know, you go to the Bronx and you walk down this walkway and the jail in Rikers Island in the Bronx is actually a slave ship that sits in the middle of the harbor by Willets Point. You know, you've got to be kidding. This is an old steamship that they floated from New Orleans 35 years ago. And it's populated with black and brown guys and shackles. I was like, really not a great look here in New York City. You can't comprehend, it's five miles from where we're sitting right here, that there is literally a slave ship. And you go to bail someone out and you're excited. They're like, all right, well, you know, I got my own little ego. I wanted to like bro hug and like hear his story. I'm like, oh, he doesn't get out till 10 o'clock. I'm there at noon. I'm like, why can't you get him now? Processing. I was like, what the hell does processing mean? They don't tell you. They're sending faxes, literally faxes, back and forth to Rikers. And I'm like, this is so archaic. And it just shows we just throw away people. You don't care. So then they're going to get out at 10 or 11. The bail window is right next to where you get your valuables, you know, the old valuable window you always see in the prison movies. Oh, that shuts at six. So the poor guy now has to walk home. They give him a subway card, long way to the subway, and then come all the way back tomorrow from wherever he's living to this shithole of a place to get his valuables, which prior ain't that valuable because most of these guys have no money. And so that whole system is just so infuriating. And so by having proven that when you bail people out, they still come back to jail. Now we're being able to change the laws. And so New York just passed a really good bail reform, and we were part of the lobbying of that. New York's way ahead of most states on some of this stuff. But the goal would be our organization's out of business in 10 years, that the country gets rational laws. But man, oh man, it's if you think of 1 to 100, I visited German prisons. They're like 92 out of 100. Norwegian prisons, 99 out of 100. We're at like 14 out of 100. I mean, it's that bad. And so we got a long way to go. Yeah. All right, Mike, I want to turn to a couple of closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Throwing parties. I have literally been throwing parties since I've been 16 years old. And I love it. I love getting my friends and people together. I love live music. I have music at my house probably more than anybody in New York City. <laughs> I literally, I have, I have a monthly gospel brunch. I have, I'm the vice chairman of the Jazz Foundation of America. I don't even play jazz. I just like it. And so that's my passion. What's your biggest pet peeve? Mean people. Meanness. To, <laughs> it's funny because I'm a wrestler and wrestlers are supposed to be tough. Oh, it just drives me crazy. It's why I dislike Donald Trump so much. He's just a mean son of a bitch. It's just, there's no reason to be mean. You got the whole world going for you. I mean, he spits bile. I would love to take him in a cage match. Or his son. I'll take his son. Both of them at the same time. <laughs> What's your biggest investment pet peeve? Well, my biggest trading pet peeve is when you don't trust yourself. Like, it just drives you crazy. I don't mind losing money when I'm wrong. I used to have a sign, great traders make money when they're right and lose money when they're wrong. And people are like, well, of course, that's true. And I was like, you don't know how hard that is. Stan Druckenmiller, when he's bullish, he's long. When he's bearish, he's short. You can say that about one in a hundred people. That's the hardest part of this job. And that's my biggest pet peeve when I screw that part up. And people are like, oh, you must have had a great day. I was like, oh, no, I didn't. Let me put a knife through my gut. <laughs> <You know? laughs> What's your favorite book or content that you read? Well, from trading, there's only one Bible, and it's called Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. Any speculator, like that is their Bible. I used to have 50 copies. I'd give it away to any young kid that came into my office. And then I got a... Paul Jones did an annotated version with his notes in the side. From the literature, I don't know, I love... There's a book called Narcissus and Goldman by Herman Hess, which I loved when I read. And a buddy just gave me a, an original copy, so I'm going to read it again. I used to read a ton. And then Wall Street and reading, you know, the phone all day and the internet, I became more of a TV head and a movie guy. And so I'm trying. This year, my goal was to read 12 fiction books, and I'm at two. So I've got a long way to go. Maybe this summer I catch up. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? If there was like a family motto, it would be just show up. Like my parents show up. Our whole family shows up. That's for funerals and weddings and when you're sick and when my brother just had another baby or when someone's in stress. And so that's it. It's just show up. And last one, what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? <laughs> it's going to be okay. That when you screw up, it feels like it's the end of the world. I've screwed up plenty of times in my life. And we often die a psychological death. That's okay. You're going to be just fine. The sun will come up tomorrow. And so 
the amount of pain and stress and self beat down I gave myself after some of these mistakes was unnecessary in lots of ways. Like suffering is just in your head in some ways, right? It's a self-centric, selfish, it's all about you. And if you can get outside of yourself and say, well, Jesus, not helping anybody. You know, when I left Fortress, I was miserable for a, luckily only a few weeks, but I was, ah, oh, I sold my stock at the wrong price. And I, did, and I, was, I just kept ruminating and beating myself up. And this Indian friend of mine was like, dude, you're not helping your kids, your wife, your, your anybody or yourself. Like, this is all about you, all about you, all about you all the time. And if you can get outside yourself, you realize he's right. And quite frankly, I made the mistakes. Can't blame on anyone else. Like own your own mistakes, let them go and move on. The faster people can learn to do that, the happier they are. It's not easy, but that's the life lesson you wish you learned earlier because it just liberates you. Great, Mike. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you know a manager you'd like to hear on the show, please reach out or ask the manager to reach out to ted at capitalallocators.com. We greatly appreciate your ideas and we'll do our best to help foster transparency and communication across the industry. Thank you.